Praise the Lord. Let us uh, turn our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. We will read from verses 21 to 31 responsively. Gospel of John, chapter 14. We'll read from verses 21 to 31 responsively. Let us read from verse 21. Yohan Suvartha Padnalu Irvayogdni Nchi Muppayogdni He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me, not keepeth not my word. Sorry, let me read that. He that loveth me not, Keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Verse 29, and now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go thence. Hence. Let us pray and look to the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you for this precious privilege you gave to open thy word and to receive, Lord, uh, this uh, truths of thine, the words of life of thine. Thou art our Lord and worthy to receive all our, Lord, uh, affection, our love, our adoration, Lord, our surrender and all because of how you gave yourself for us. Lord, we come to you this morning desiring that uh, your word may have free course in my life, in our lives, that uh, you may cause us and stir us, Lord, uh, you may, Lord, uh, kindle in us a fire, uh, a fresh uh, love towards you that is worthy, Lord, of thy great love with which you have loved us. Father, I pray that you would bless our meditation of thy word in receiving it with readiness and that we would respond, Lord, uh, in humility, longing, Lord, uh, to let our lives be brought into fulfilling this highest calling that you have given to us. Lord, we ask that you would bless our time that uh, this word may also bring to us the much needed comfort uh, in the way that you have spoken to your own the disciples as you left this world. Submitting our time before us into your loving hands, in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This uh, portion that uh, we are going to look at today deals with uh, Something that is, I would uh, say, is man's great calling and comfort. 
before I come to what it is, you and I would take note that uh, probably these are the last set of words that Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the upper room. Uh, in verse 31, we see he says, Arise and let us go thence. And probably from then on, he began to walk towards the olive, uh, the, the, the garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to spend that night um, before being betrayed. But uh, as they are concluding this meal, the supper that Jesus wanted to much earnestly spend with his disciples, he's giving these last words of comfort. We'll come to understanding the part of comfort uh, towards the end, but I would want to begin by saying that this portion also outlines a calling that God has for all mankind. A calling for you, a calling for me. And uh, I would say that is the great calling. Um, and uh, there are many callings in our lives. Um, a calling such as being a preacher or being a minister of God's word, uh, a pastor or also, even a personal note, we have these callings that God gives to us once we receive a child, a newborn. God is entrusting to us a calling of being the father to the child. Once we are married, God entrusts to us the calling of being a husband or a wife. Um, and some other callings in this world that exist are like a teacher or a soldier or a, uh, or a doctor. They're all, in a way, callings, meaning um, more than just doing it for the, for the sake of duty or m for the money, may these be seen that they are of great responsibility. That is the distinction between a calling versus a job. Now, having said that, um, the portion that we read has one phrase that gives to us a clue about that calling. And that deals with uh, this word called love. If you and I notice in the portion we read from verses 21 to 31, there are many verses in this portion where it talks about love, loving Christ, and uh, the love of the Father, the love of Christ. And so here we're going to look at this word called love where Many a times when we think about love, it is understood in a very different way from the world and the upbringing that you and I have. Many see it more of a, a romantic attraction or a strong feeling. But uh, when we come to the true meaning of love, as we mature in our understanding, especially from the biblical perspective, we see love is more than just a romantic attraction or a strong feelings of attraction towards those that are close to you. It also stands for truth, it stands for respect and obedience as Christian, uh, you and I would hold to God. Now, when I say this, the reason I say that is you often use this word, we use this word very lightly. You, you and I would say, I love my family, which, which is good in one sense. Some would also go about to say, I love my hobby or I love my game or cricket. So much so that uh, you and I would die for that or something like that. Um, well, when this word is lightly used, we might miss the true meaning of it. But biblically, we see that uh, many that fight, there are many things in this world that fight for our love. That is, they are trying to get the most of our selves and uh, we need to be very careful in how we channel our love and who it is who gets the supreme love. Uh, we're going to look at all that but in all uh, our time today my goal and I would want to also submit that I've got some of the thoughts are from uh, a man of God by name J.C. Ryle in his book called Holiness. Um, uh, he takes a, a particular section of the book and talks about this same 
um, theme that I'm going I'm going to touch today, and some of the thoughts are taken from that. But uh, as he expressed, even my desire is that it should be our privilege uh, that um, there is someone who is worthy to take a place and claim for uh, for for from our lives of the love that he is fully worthy meaning uh, he alone is worthy of all our hearts feeling and affection the supreme love that we can give to him and we'll look at it from the scriptural perspective where uh, we see in this portion that uh, in verse 21 it begins this way john chapter 14 verse 21 he says that is jesus says he that hath my my commandments and keep it them, it is he that loveth me. Uh, notice, not just in verse 21, we see in verse 23, if a man love me, that is Jesus talking about a clause, a conditional clause to, to show how they would express the love that somebody would have towards Christ. And then verse 24, he that loveth me not, and then in verse 28, in the middle part, you would read, If ye love me, four times we see Jesus giving to us a mention of loving Christ. Uh, when we think about these, these words that Jesus asked, you and I should quickly be able to relate to a sweeping question that Jesus asked. In fact, there are two sweeping questions that Jesus asked his beloved disciple and uh, those are some those are some uh, some of the greatest questions that every human being should pose to themselves um i'd want to bring that up where um he gives these two questions to his beloved disciple called peter and uh, he goes about to ask this question in this way in matthew chapter 16 verse 16 we know what do men say or you say i am who do you think i am is the question that jesus asked his beloved disciple peter and uh, that's a question that would define our destiny in eternity there's also one other question that peter was asked in john 21 verse 15 the question he was asked is lovest thou me this is also a very sweeping question because it's going to divide humanity in the destiny that they would have based on the answer that somebody were to give to these questions. And so it's a question that you and I should ask for ourselves sincerely but uh, carefully because this answer that you give to this question, who do you think Christ is or who do you think Jesus is and who do you think or or and the question that Jesus asked to Peter is lovest thou me do you and I love Christ the reason I say that is today we're going to look at five aspects of uh, loving Christ that I would want to lay down before us um, and uh, we will begin trying to understand the importance of this um, and that is, the first one is, I want us to submit, uh, to take note that uh, there are some hindrances to loving Christ. We see um, that in uh, verse 24, if, sorry, in verse 24, John 8, 14, we read, He that loveth me not, meaning there are few or some who would not love Christ. And this is the kind of category of people that we'll also be talking about. And the reasons for that is there are some hindrances to loving Christ that we would examine. There's also these marks of loving Christ that we will look at in this portion. There are some marks of loving Christ or an expression of loving Christ. Um, there are also, the thirdly, the model for loving Christ is also given to us towards the end of this portion that we read. We're going to look at that. Fourthly, we're going to look at um, the benefits of loving Christ. 
which is more of a list that I would give rather than expanding too much on that. And lastly, the aid to loving Christ. All these are five things that we would watch, but I would want to first begin by giving to us, uh, before we go into the hindrances, the reason why it is important that somebody should love Christ is given to us uh, in how Jesus asked his beloved disciple before recommissioning. In uh, John 21, we will come back to it uh, when we come to uh, dwelling in chapter 21, but I just briefly wa would want to mention, when Peter who denied Christ thrice was being restored and recommissioned to be given the privilege of feeding the lambs of Christ or feeding the body of Christ, the sheep of Christ, in caring for them and feeding for them, before he could be given that commission and uh, he can be restored, the question that Jesus asked his beloved disciple is not to say, are you willing to confess me again? Or he didn't say, do you believe me? Or he didn't even say, like, uh, are you going to deny me again? But the sweeping question he asks is, lovest thou me? Do you love me? Is the question that Peter was asked. And uh, it's vitally important that we have our lives taking note of this question. Because Paul, in the later verses in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, as he closes this letter in verses 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 22, he says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Meaning, somebody who is cursed. Meaning, somebody who has the curse of sin and the wrath of God upon them that is not taken away. They are still under that curse and they will destine themselves to an eternity that is without Christ. Oh, the danger of being in the state of not loving Christ. Not only this, in fact, uh, in this Christian circles, we often use this word called grace so cheaply and so lightly and I want us to take note in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul was closing the letter that he wrote to Ephesians and as he was trying to use what is the, uh, the designation or qualification he wants to use to address to the Christians in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 23, he says, Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God. Actually, in verse 24, we read, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. It is essential that grace is available to you and me only when you and I have a love for Christ. And so, it is so important that our destiny of where we will spend eternity is dependent upon this response to this question, do you and I love Christ? And so, uh, when you and I think that these are just the words of Apostle Paul, you and I can come to the Gospel of John chapter 8 itself. The Gospel of John chapter 8, in verse 42, we see the words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. When he was conversing with the Jewish people who say, Abraham is our father. And so by definition, we are God's people and uh, we are not servants or slaves to sin. Nobody needs to set us free. We are free people. When Jesus hears that, he says this beautiful statement. He says in verse 42, John 8, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Today, if you and I claim anything to say that we are sons of God or daughters of God, you and I have sonship of God, you and I should come to, you and I cannot claim to be having the sonship of God until and unless you and I have loving of Christ. And so that 
is such uh, that is a reminder of the importance of loving Christ. Now, having said that, um, I want us to first go on to see in John chapter 14, uh, firstly, the marks or the expression of loving Christ. Jesus gives that in verse 21. He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. The simple expression of loving Christ is obedience. Obedience is the mark or an expression of how you and I would love Christ. Now, I, I want us also not to misunderstand that the initiator of loving Christ is not us. Actually, we see that through and through the Gospel of John. It is God who first loved us. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, we read, not that we loved God, but He loved us first and gave Himself. That is, God the Father. Now, even in John 3.16, we all know God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, more than all, in John chapter 6, we see the words of our Lord Jesus Christ where He says, Unless the Father draws somebody, he cannot come to Christ. In uh, verse 37, John chapter 6, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast away. And uh, in the following verses we would see that it is the supernatural drawing of God, the Father, who are led to see their desperate need for Christ. That would uh, that would so receive uh, that love to Christ, and so it is not to say that you and I can initiate loving Christ by obeying His commandments. It's, it's a reciprocation. Once we recognize how much God loved us, we would then begin to love Him back, and the way we do that is by showing our obedience to His commandments, and that's the way Jesus is reminding to his disciples that it is this mark of obedience which is the true expression of our love to Christ. And so, we are looking at the first aspect of loving Christ, that is the marks of loving Christ. And the first one is that you and I would keep his commandments. You see that repeated in a number of ways. In verse 23, Jesus again says that. Jesus answered when uh, Judas uh, another disciple, probably the son of James, uh, he asked, uh, how is it you are going to manifest to us and not to the world? Jesus again reiterates this and he says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. This is again in another way to say that obedience is the key to showing our love to Christ. Um, we will continue to look at the marks of Christ later, but I would want to have us take note of the hindrances of loving Christ. Because if you and I were to say that we do love Christ, maybe our thoughts might go quickly to this. Yes, I obey Christ. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. Uh, all these are some doings that you and I might claim to say, I love Christ. But the sad reality is that there are most important commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ. If they have not been obeyed, though you and I might say that I love Christ because I go to church, I have a Christian name, I, I know about Him and I read my Bible, all these would not amount to anything. Our love to Christ is first expressed in the obedience to these first uh, commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to follow with me certain commands that Jesus gave, which are so pivotal, so vital in uh, showing our allegiance, our true love. And that is a love of sincerity. Uh, all the other ex uh, external kind of expression of going to church, having a Christian name, and uh, outward expressions are not uh, the first means of 
the marks of of uh, loving Christ and that is we see in uh, Matthew chapter 4 as Jesus began his ministry in verse 17 this is the first thing that he began to preach in ja Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 the first commandment that Jesus gave or the first words that Jesus preached as captured in the gospels he says is to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and uh, unless that true repentance had been your and my portion, there can't be any expression of true love and sincere love towards Christ. Not only that, in fact, the commandments of Christ are also given to us in Matthew 5, if you take notice. Actually, Matthew 4 verse 19, when he talked to the disciples, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You know, today, that command is also for us that you and I are to be followers of Christ. Christians are not somebody who put a Christian name and say they are born in a Christian family, but the ones who follow Christ, who walk after his footsteps, obey his commands. And uh, it should be first of repentance and then following in obedience, without which there is no sincere and true love. Moving forward in Matthew 5, we see how Jesus opens up the heart of the commandments of the Old Testament, that is the law. Many a times he opens up in this chapter of Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about that thou have heard in the old time, in Matthew 5 verse 21, he talks about the commandment of the Ten Commandments, that thou shall not kill, and he opens the heart of it from verses 22 to 26, and he says, but I say unto you, as a command, he says, you and I ought not to hate our brother and call our brother with uh, the words that are described there. And then he opens up the heart of the commandment of do not commit adultery in verse 27 and 28. He expands that to say that it is not external adultery that matters, but more importantly, even a heart of where uh, our hearts are, and so on and so forth. He goes on to expand the commandments and gives the heart. Now, after having given all that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he first goes about to say, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is a command. This is not a suggestion, a good advice, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Today, if you and I are lovers of Christ, if you and I are those that would say in sincerity and in uh, in all of your heartful expression, you are loving Christ, you would have repented of your sins and you would have been the one who would be seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is that true of you and me? If not, you and I have not the true marks of loving Christ or true expression of loving Christ. And uh, that brings me to the second part of loving Christ, which is the hindrances for loving Christ. There are certain hindrances of why anyone would not love Christ. And I would want to bring some of them, not an exhaustive list. And that is, the first one is, there is no true understanding or a proper understanding of who he really is. The common ones are this, that uh, there is this thinking and understanding that Jesus is a Jewish person. Yes, he is born in Judea, in Israel, and he is Jewish by race, but he is not mere a Jewish person. In fact, John Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1 and 3 talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 3, all things have been made by him, that is the word of God. And he became flesh in verse 14. Jesus is no mere Jewish rabbi or a teacher or a good person, as some might think, but he is the creator God, the very maker of you and me, who made us in his own image, who made us for, your, for, for himself. 
and that's why we were reminded in our worship time in Romans chapter 11 the last verse that it is by him and through him and for him that all things have been made and uh, if you and I had that misunderstanding about why should I receive a foreign God or consider Jesus to be one among many gods, many take this take that Jesus is only one among many gods and that is a, a, a sad uh, misunderstanding of who he is. In the Gospel of John chapter 17 verse 3 we see this sweeping statement where Jesus says and this is eternal life. If somebody is to have eternity with God and have eternal life and not perish this is what they should have. That is, this is eternal life. This is in the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they might know thee, the only true God. There is only one true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus was sent by God the Father. And uh, he is the only true God. And he sent his only begotten son. That is, in John 3.16, I was reminding, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is only one true God and there is only one begotten son who was sent. And uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, we were reminded previously that I am the way, the truth, and nobody comes to the Father without me, in verse 7. And so, uh, verse 6, here we see there is only one true God and one Savior, that is Jesus, sent as a begotten Son to die for your sins and mine. And there is only one way of salvation. I hope that clears out all your misunderstandings. I pray so that you and I would not have this hindrance, this block of receiving Christ's love and reciprocating and loving Him back because of a mere misunderstanding of assuming him to be a Jewish rabbi or a good person or one among many gods. Quickly, I will move to the second, mis second hindrance, that is, not understanding of what he really did. Many a times, people have this misunderstanding that he is just a good teacher who taught some good moral principles. Sadly, that is far from truth. He came not to just be a good teacher. Yes, he was. There was no teacher like him because he taught the truth as is. But he is not to be misunderstood that he just taught some moral principles. He is somebody who died for you and for me. Who loved you and me enough to be your sin bearer and mine. And having made you in his own image, he loved you to die for you, to re-own you. And if that doesn't make you understand what he did for you, it is the work of the enemy of our soul who blinds us from what he did for us. In uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul, a Jewish Pharisee who was able to keep all the law from his childhood as he claims to be blemishless, or blameless according to the law, when this religious man came to see who hated Christ and his followers, killed the Christians for his living, when he came to see what Jesus did for him, in Galatians 2.20 he expresses, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died for all the sins of the mankind. In every nook and corner, whichever religious background you and I might be, he did what no one else did in laying down his life, dying on the cross, taking the wrath of God that you and I deserve. He loved you and me and gave himself for me. And that is why Paul says that it is not I who live, but Christ that liveth in me, who loved me and gave himself for me. In Galatians 2.20. May that be your and my expression and not be brought under this hindrance. Lastly, the third hindrance that people have, apart from misunderstanding who Jesus really is, apart from misunderstanding uh, 
what he really did the third misunderstanding is that there is a misunderstanding about the gospel many a times the gospel message is diluted or it is it is corrupted or it is mixed with all kinds of prosperity things when the core of the truth of the gospel is these four things that is god is holy man is sinful including you and me every human being christ is that sinless sacrifice lamb who took all the sins and god is ready to justify you and me to forgive you and make you and me his son and daughter this is the gospel the true gospel is un is understood in these four truths god is love is something that many would love to embrace but miss to understand that god is so holy that he abhors sin and uh, yet he loved you and me whom he made in his own image that when man rebelled against him in his sin knowing well that man is not worthy christ was sent to be that sin bearer and that he died so that god can freely justify you make you his son and make you to have eternal life and if that is misunderstood as the gospel if that is not the gospel that you have received but having received some other gospel where you and i think that uh, jesus is there to just heal you or give promotions or give you some riches that is also a reason why you would not have love for christ but just go on with your life wanting just the benefits from christ so quickly we saw two things the first one is the expression or the marks of loving christ the second one is the hindrances of loving christ thirdly i want us to bring to us um the the third aspect of loving christ which is that god has given to mankind that is is given as a model for loving christ i want you to really come with me to the gospel of john chapter 14 verses 30 and 31 verses 29 and 29 to 31 here jesus is giving that he is ready to leave this world it's not a, a friendly vacation that jesus is trying to take to leave to a place for some time but he is leaving this world to fulfill the command that god has given for which he is willingly laying down his life that is what he says and he is not going to the cross as a pawn of satan captured by him so that satan can extract from him his life and receive some kind of penalty satan has no hold on him that's what he says in verse 30 he says hereafter i will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me that is the S- satan has no grip no hold uh this is understood well in a small illustration i could try to explain to us i don't know about you in childhood when uh, you and i are in a school often uh, when two or three friends i remember it in my in our hostel when uh, we behaved uh, uh, doing some naughty things uh, the warden used to run after to catch us and uh, the moment uh, he sees us he tries to grab a a hand uh, grab a hand or our hair or something as chill as we are running away and uh, there was a kid who had all his head shaved bald so his hair was not reachable so the warden could grab the handle of the one who had long hair but the one who didn't have hair there's no grip he could hold on and so so is it with satan satan has no way or no room to get a grip on christ because there is no sin in him he knew no sin he did no sin and uh, there was no guile in him and so there is no handle that satan can have no part that satan have and yet uh, we see that as a sinless lamb of god 
he took your sin and mine in obedience to to the father that's what he says in verse 31 he says that the world may know that i love the father see the the love between the father and his beloved son that there is this love towards the father that he had which is why he was willingly obeying to the commandment that he received and willingly laying down his life oh we see that in ephesians chapter 5 last week we talked about uh, all the real rich and uh, renewed right, risen life that we receive in christ ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 gives to us this picture of the model of uh, loving christ ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 be ye therefore followers of god as dear children and walk in love as christ hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to god for a sweet smelling savor so here is it that the model for loving christ is given by christ himself in how he loved his father he loved his father in all his earthly journey he stole time to spend time with his father and uh, he communed with his father he obeyed his father it's not out of duty or obligation he was ex- he was ready to express his love to the father in doing what the father longed that someone would be willing to lay down his life for the remission of the sins of humanity who had been made in the image of god and so the model for loving christ is given by christ himself in what christ did was not of obligation but of obedience and a great expression of love that he, christ has modeled for us as he died on the cross where he cried out to the father and he said father forgive them they know not what they do he was crying out for every sinner like you and me whose sin was the cause for putting him on the cross and uh, and so the model for loving christ is found in the sacrifice and the obedience of christ and quickly fourthly we see the benefits of loving christ this is seen through and through from verses 21 to 27 i want you to follow me and in closing we will come to the aid to loving christ i'm going to talk about that but before that let me talk about the benefits of loving christ there are seven fold benefits of loving christ I want you to track with me the first one is you and i in verse 21 the moment you and i are loving christ you and i are loved by the father oh the great blessing of being loved by the father the father has this sweet expression of love towards you and me you know what was the expression before you and i loved christ his wrath was to be upon you and me but instead of that wrath you and i are reconciled to him no more enemies but dear sons just as he loved christ he begins to love you and me oh when you and i think about that the comfort that comes to us is amazing that god would have you his beloved son and he loves you just as he loved christ that is the prayer that our lord jesus christ prayed in john chapter 17 come with me to verse 23 john chapter 17 as jesus was praying in the garden of gethsemane the prayer that he prayed is amazing he prayed for you and me and he says that i should be in them and thou in me that is the father in in christ that they should be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me oh when you think that christ prayed that god the father should love you just as he loved christ and you think christ's prayer is not answered wow it's such a joy to see the benefits of loving christ the first benefit is that you and i are loved by the father you and i are beloved to the father 
may that be your and my state today. The second benefit, as we see in verse um, 23, is that actually in verse 21 itself, we see. Yeah, in verse 21, we see, He that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him. That is, Christ loves us. You know, there is a different way in which Christ would start loving us. Um, he loved all to give his life for us. That is true, that Christ has laid down his life as he died on the cross of Calvary. Um, God so loved the world. But the truth is, He loves us doubly as His own. That's what we saw in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 1, when He came to spend time with His disciples at the Passover, the last Passover He spent. He says in verse 13, Having loved His own, which were in the world, He loved them unto the end. That is the greatest love that Christ gives is that he loves us as his own. We are owned by him because of one he created us. He's our maker. He's our owner and because he made us. But you and I rejected him of being our owner and went and enslaved ourselves to Satan and uh, became his possession. You know, when you and I are returned to the state of loving Christ, you and I are restored to be loved doubly, that we are owned by him twice. Not only that he is our maker, but he is our redeemer and uh, he is our savior. He loves us doubly now as his own. And so the second benefit is we are loved not just by the Father, we are loved by Christ as his own. Thirdly, in verse 21 itself, the third benefit is, will manifest myself unto him. Christ will manifest himself. That is, you and I would know Christ. It's like this, not just hearing about Christ, just like somebody would say, I know about uh, Donald Trump or some great person, but there is a difference between knowing about him and knowing him. That is, once you meet and once he knows you by name and have some relationship, there is this privilege of manifestly knowing. And that's the place that you and I would have as a benefit. Christ would manifest himself to us. You would know him intimately, just like a husband would know a wife and a wife, a husband. So is it that intimate knowing that you and I would come to. Uh, thirdly, sorry, fourthly, the benefits of loving Christ. Firstly, loved by the Father. Secondly, loved by Christ as his own. Thirdly, manifest, Christ manifests himself. Fourthly, in verses 23, we see, we will come to him. That is, the Father in Christ will come to him. Oh, they will come to him. Before they were alienated from him, from them. That is, without God, you and I are alienated from the life of God and are far from Him. Now, God is nigh unto us when we love Christ or when we have a love to Christ. Fifthly, and make our abode with Him, verse 23 itself, we see that Christ and Father would make Him is their dwelling with us. Make us as his, as their home. Make us as his dwelling place. Oh, it's just a glimpse of what we are going to have for eternity. Where for eternity, God is going to dwell with his people by sight. Now it is more of a spiritual presence that Father and Son would dwell in us. And we have his presence. We are made his temple. But a day will come not only spiritually, but physically, by sight, you and I have the dwelling of God with us. As revealed in Revelation 21 verse 3 and 4, God would make his dwelling with his people. He will wipe out all tears. 
and uh, there is no need of any more temple. He will be their temple. And fifth, sixthly, in verse 26, this is the blessing of, of uh, loving Christ, that there is a comforter who would be sent. And he would be sent for primarily those that love Christ, that have received that love of Christ. In verse 26, we see, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so, you and I receive the comforter who would make his permanent dwelling. The triune God is going to dwell in us and make our make us as his abode, their abode. And so, here we come to see, and lastly, but not least, in verse 27 we see, we receive the peace that Christ gives. In verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Christ's peace is far different from the peace that the world gives. World's peace is absence of conflict, absence of war, and uh, world's peace is more of a false peace. That is, it is limited in time. Till only war begins or conflict arises or restlessness comes, that peace seems to be there. But God's peace or Christ's peace is a peace that passeth all understanding. A peace first with God. Before we had enmity with God, now we have peace with God as we are justified through Christ, Romans 5 verse 1. Now, not only we have peace with God, we have peace of God. That is, when reasons don't, doesn't make sense, when there is no reasoning as to why you and I are in a certain situation, you and I would have still peace. So, Christ's peace is not like the world peace, which is absence of war or conflict, but in spite of troubles, in spite of conflict, in spite of all things around us that is falling apart, you and I would have this peace. In Philippians 4 verse 7, it talks about once we make our petitions known with thanksgiving, the peace of God that passeth all understanding, it guards our heart. It is beyond reasoning why you and I have peace, but you and I would have that peace. Not only so, quickly, Christ's peace is that the God of peace will dwell in us. In the same chapter, Philippians 4, we see that the name that God has is called that He's called the God of peace. He's the one who has all the peace that we need in spite of what is going on in this world, in spite of what the future might seem bleak. There is this peace for someone who loves Christ and that is what God has in store as the benefits of loving Christ. And so in quickly, we saw firstly the hindrances of loving Christ, the, ex the marks of loving Christ or the expression of loving Christ. Secondly, thirdly, we saw the model for loving Christ, which is Christ himself. Fourthly, we saw the benefits of loving Christ. And finally, I want us to close by bringing to us the aid to loving Christ. Before I go there, I want to have us take note in this expression of loving Christ, there is a, an important thing that you and I need to take note of. I said the expression of the marks of loving Christ is obedience, right? And that is, when you and I obey the commandments of Christ, that's how you and I show our sincere love to Christ. Now, when I say obedience, there ought to be three different ways of obedience. One is called the implicit obedience. The second one is called delayed obedience. The third one is disobedience. Of course, the third obedience is not obedience at all. It is a, an antonym. But the first two seems like obedience, but there is only one that is obedience in the right mode. That is implicit obedience. That is doing it in the very next opportunity, next moment, 
And there is also this delayed obedience which is more close to disobedience. Many a times when Christ says in, in Matthew chapter 28, he gave this command as he has uh, to the disciples. When uh, he rose up from the grave, this is the last command that Jesus gave to his disciples. The last words are very important and uh, we ought to take note. And here is this great commission, so called, that we all remember. In verse 28, verse 19 and 20 of Matthew 28, we see, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. In this, there are at least four commands that are given. The command to go, the command to teach, the command to observe, the command to baptize. When we see this is the portion of every disciple, that is, you and I ought to go, that is, in the place that God has given, move out of our comfort zone to obey the command of God. Having loved Him, you and I should be willing to speak out and go to give the gospel. Second, we are to teach all nations, wherever, whichever nation you and I might be. You and I are called to be teaching in the portion that God has given, even in, it might be in a family setting or wherever it is, to our children or to, to those that God entrusts to us. You and I are to teach the words of Christ. Baptize them. And this word is important that the word baptism is a command, it's not a suggestion, it's not a good idea that some man or church has invented, it is the command of Christ. And uh, if you and I would say that I love Christ and are not willing to be baptized, I dare say you are not loving Christ. Because that is the first command that any child of God is given after repenting of their sins and trusting in the Savior and believing the gospel, you and I would want to obey in the waters of baptism. Otherwise, there is no true love. There is no sincere love. And I would go about to say the words of our Apostle Paul where he says, the one who doesn't love Christ, he is anathema or cursed or still under the wrath of God. And may that be a, a time that we examine ourselves. And so, you and I are called to baptize. That is, those that are willing to witness in the waters of baptism, you and I are to witness and enable them to be baptized. And quickly, you and I are to observe all things. That is, do what Christ has commanded. And so, as we come to close with uh, regards to the aid to loving Christ, I wanted us to take note that in the marks of loving Christ, in the expression of loving Christ, may it be that our obedience is implicit and not delayed, which is equal most likely to the disobedience category. May it be that our expression is implicit obedience. Now quickly, the aid to loving Christ. I want us to close, but uh, in this section that we read, we saw that uh, in verse 28, there is a statement that Christ had made uh, which gives to us the, the words that help us to understand Trinity a little. In verse 28, uh, Jesus says that if you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I go on to the Father for my Father is greater than I. That is, when you and I come to Recognizing the triune God, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there is a, a heresy that was settled in the church history about what is the, the is there a hierarchy between the triune God, between the persons of the triune God. The, and especially 
it it comes out of this verse in verse 28 where jesus says for my father is greater than i it seems obviously like a clear expression where christ god the son is saying that god the father is greater than i meaning there seems to be a hierarchy on the surface but the fact is that when we look at the scripture on the whole especially as we come to the book of revelation even in matthew chapter 28 as uh, the disciples were giving their worship in matthew chapter 28 as they come to the risen savior in verses 16 and 17 uh, we see matthew 28 then the 11 disciples that is without judas the rest of them went away into galilee into the mountain where jesus had appointed them in verse 17 and when they saw him they worshiped him but some doubted that is jesus received worship when he was upon this earth and uh, in number of times throughout the gospels we see that and more importantly in the book of revelation chapter 4 and 5 we see as john gets the glimpse of the throne room of god where the elders and the angels and uh, the four heavenly beasts and the 24 elders in verse 10 chapter 4 of revelation and the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy o lord to receive glory honor power and power for thou has created all things and for thy pleasure they were created not only here in verse 20 uh, verse chapter 5 verse 12 we see the words that are said said there saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing so we see that the worship that was given was not exclusive to the father but equally equal worship was given to this god the son as well and uh, even in the gospel of john chapter 5 verse 23 jesus himself says just as you honor the father so ought you to honor the son gospel of john chapter 5 verse 20 uh, verse 23 we see that all men should honor the son even as they honor the father this is not some kind of a, an invention but all through the scriptures we see that christ as the son of god receives equal worship because of his equality with god the father now how are we to understand this words of our lord jesus christ john chapter 14 verses 28 where jesus says for my father is greater than i the truth is that christ was operating in economic subordination as a role that christ played to be your and my substitute he humbled himself and he emptied himself as philippians chapter 2 verse 6 to 8 captures for us that is he though being god didn't stay in that glory that he had from eternity with the father in the gospel of john chapter 17 verse 5 jesus himself says O oh, Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with the glory with which I had with Thee before the world was. Before the world was created, Jesus had equal glory with the Father. But because of the role that He is playing as a sinless substitute to the sins that is to be paid on the cross of Calvary, Jesus was operating in economic subordination. and so he says my father is greater than i in that role that he is playing and so the truth is there is an ontological equality that is as a being of god as a person is equal with the father but economic submission subordination that is as a role that he is playing he humbles himself to say my father is greater than i and that is how the church through the chalcian uh, creed nicene uh, creed settled the heresy 
of Irenaeus um, who brought up uh, that Jesus is a created being. And so we ought not to go into that heresy or even the hierarchy that some would prescribe. And so coming back in closing, there is a means of how God has given us an aid to loving Christ. I want to have us take note of that in close quickly. That is, the aid to loving Christ that God has given to us is in this comforter himself. In verse 26, we read in uh, John 14 verse 26, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit of God, when he comes in uh, Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 5, we read that there is a, a receiving that you and I as a child of God receive. I uh, would want to bring uh, this uh, aid to loving Christ, though is not uh, specially as a direct application from this portion that we read, but much important one, which is vital for our Christian walk in loving Christ. That is, the aid to loving Christ is received to us through the Spirit of God. In Romans 5 verse 5 we read, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Today, the reason you and I may have not begun to love Christ, though externally you might claim to be, is because you have not received the Holy Spirit of God who is convicting you of your sin. We would see that in the Gospel of John chapter uh, 16 verse 8 onwards. When He comes, the Holy Spirit of God, He would convict us, everyone of their sin and uh, of righteousness and of judgment. And when that work of the Spirit of God happens, He would come into your heart and pour forth a love for Christ and cleanse you with the blood of Christ from all sin and unrighteousness and make you His child, giving you a fresh love towards Christ who gave Himself up for you and for me. And so the aid to loving Christ is the Holy Spirit of God Himself. Now, when I say that, you and I ought to take note of there are many hindrances uh, that I didn't list in the first part which actually help us to understand the, the aid to loving Christ. That is, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 14, we see that in the last days, as iniquity uh, is going to grow, many people's love will wax cold. That is, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Today, there is a need for fresh kindling of that love towards Christ and uh, for which you and I are called to ask for that love of Christ to be poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit of God. And it doesn't happen just by uh, praying a bit more harder in a harder, in a harder way but it happens by yielding to the work of the Spirit of God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we read Paul's exhortation to a Christian. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, it's not enough that you would have Christ, the Holy Spirit of God be, um, be once given to us in the initial salvation time, but that you and I ought to grow in having Him control our lives. And that is the true expression of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Unlike those that are controlled by wine, you and I are to be controlled by the Spirit. That is, you and I are to yield to the work of the Spirit of God and thereby you and I receive a more filling of the Spirit of God. That is, a more love that is poured afresh towards Christ. And uh, in the same book, same letter that Paul writes to Ephesians, Paul prays with, in this way for the Ephesian believers. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 onwards, he prays about how you and I are to be strengthened in the inner man by the might 
with might by his spirit and then in verse 17 he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye may be rooted and grounded in love and in verse 18 he says may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth the length the depth the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge today the way you and I are renewed and strengthened in the inner man by the Spirit of God, that you and I might be rooted and grounded in love and uh, may grow in our understanding of Christ's love, the depth, the height, the width and the, and the length of Christ's love. To what length he went, the breadth of Christ's love, to how much he loved us the depth of it, the height of it. And when you and I comprehend that, it begins to constrain us. The love of Christ would constrain us to love him back. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, we see that it is the love of Christ that constrains us to live for him. You and I can't live Christian life by just believing in Christ and growing in our knowledge of the Bible. You and I might do so as a, a duty but there is a difference between duty and expression of love a nurse in the hospital may do her duty properly and well may give the sick man his medicine at the right time may feed him minister to him and attend to all his wants but there is a vast difference between that nurse and a wife tending her sick husband and so there is a difference between love and duty. And quickly, when you and I love Christ, you and I have all these things that as part of examination, I would want us to take note. If you and I love Christ, you and I would want to please Him. That is, when we look at uh, two people who are engaged to each other, there is no necessity of making them to understand what they need to do to love each other. And that is, they begin automatically to change their tastes, opinions, and act upon his or her advice and do things which he or she approves. When even denying ourselves to meet uh, the other one's wishes and abstain from things. And that is how even it is with regards to our life, love to Christ. You and I would long to please Him and uh, that would be our portion. And finally, when you and I would love Christ, we would want to always tell about Him. There's no necessity of uh, two engaged people to talk about their fiancé, right? As Christ has betrothed, betrothed us to be His bride, how is it that you and I can't talk about Him uh, when it at every given opportunity, you and I are given to talk about him. I'll close with this small illustration. It says this way. Man said a thoughtless, ungodly English traveler to a North American Indian convert. A North American Indian convert was confronted by an English traveler as he came from Britain to here. He asked this question to this Indi North American Indian convert. Man, what is the reason that you make so much of Christ and talk so much about him? What has this Christ done for you that you should make so much about him? The converted Indian did not answer him in words. He gathered together some dry leaves and a moss and made a ring with him with them on the ground. He picked up a live worm and put it in the middle of the ring. He struck a light and set the moss and leaves on fire. The flame soon rose and he scorched the worm. It withered in agony and trying in vain to escape on every side, curled itself up in the middle as if it, it is about to die in despair. At that moment, the Indian reached forth his hand, took up that warm gently and placed it on his bosom. 
Stranger, he said to the Englishman, do you see that warm? I was that perishing creature. I was that dying in my sins, hopeless, helpless, and on the brink of eternal fire. It was Jesus Christ who put forth his arm of his power. It was Jesus Christ who delivered me with the hand of his grace and plucked me from everlasting burnings. It was Jesus Christ who placed me, a poor sinful worm, near the heart of his love, stranger. That is the reason why I talk about Jesus Christ and make much of him. I am not ashamed of it because I love him. May that be your and my response in love to our Christ. You and I would not but talk about him, please him and uh, spend time with him. Grow in our love, in our understanding, whereby this part of it would be our portion. This is the highest calling and uh, this is the comfort too. When the disciples were having his beloved Master, leave them upon whom they have put all their hopes, all their future, all their life uh, dreams. When he was leaving them, he was wanting them to be assured that this love that they have to Christ, which would be expressed in their implicit obedience, would be their greatest comfort. He didn't give any other comfort as much as this great comfort of loving Christ. And the moment they have this love, that love for Christ is going to bring all the benefits of the Spirit of God, the triune God dwelling in them, in us today as well. And uh, when we take note of all this, our love for Christ is what would uh, be giving us this greatest calling uh, that man had ever received. And let's close here with a word of prayer and ask the Lord for his blessing. And uh, since uh, it took a little extra time for us to take note of this important call, uh, I want us to also pause in response to the word to consider where we are in our love, in our expression to Christ. May it be so that we would uh, examine ourselves in the light of God's word and prepare to partake in the elements of those that are here and remember his sacrifice as often as we come around the ta table. It might not be that you are getting to partake here, but may you remember that sacrifice of our Lord because of which you and I are called to love him back. 